Okay, uh, this is Mike Davis with Lovecraft Easy, and today is, let's see, March the 30th, 2014, and today we're going to talk about uh, Thomas Ligotti, um, The Grim Scribes Puppets also, which is a tribute anthology edited by Joe Pulver, a uh, tribute anthology um, to Thomas Ligotti's works. Um, and I uh, might even throw a little True Detective in there, we'll see. Um, I should talk about this a little bit. But, you know, I'm going to start off with a question here, and then you guys just kind of take it and run with it. And my question is this. If someone who's never read Thomas Ligotti says to you, okay, well, you know, what the hell is this fiction like? How would you describe it? I mean, because he is very, very different. Uh, what would you say? Let, let's start with that. So... Don't everybody reply at once. Yeah. Anybody. <laughs> we'll pick on Mike Griffin. Okay. <laughs> of course, of course, my uh, opinion on Ligotti would be the definitive. Uh, in my opinion, I think Ligotti. I've always thought of Ligotti as a guy who wants to be a philosopher and worked his way into that by writing stories that were heavy with philosophy, sort of packed with philosophy more than anything else. Mm-hmm and uh, got to the point where he just, at the end, jumped over the line and decided to be just a, just write about philosophy in, entirely and not, not fiction anymore. Um, I haven't really gone back and traced like, the timeline of the, of the stories to see if it's truly a progression, um, where he started off writing something more like weird fiction and, and uh, went more and more on digressions about the meaning of existence or the futility of life and so forth, uh, or if it was just uh, if, if that's just the way I see it. But to me, more than most writers, he's a he's a philosophical kind of a thinking writer, and he has things he wants to say about uh, the human mm. predicament. You know, uh, maybe more so than other writers who are more com more interested in in character and plot and stuff like that. Right. Well, True. death is a big, big thing, right? Big Go ahead, Joe. He's always been a big atmospherist. Things like uh, E.M. Charan, uh, the, at the, On the Heights of Despair, um, those philosophical, philosophical works have, have always been in, in, in a majority of Ligotti's fiction, more and more heavily a, as time went on. But but even early on, we begin to see it in, in select tales. Um, uh, but, you know, like Charan, Ligotti's mentioned him, even in early interviews, there was, there was a name that was, was, was coming up. Because that was a, a philosopher um, that I was completely unaware of until the first time Ligotti mentioned him in an interview. And I believe the first thing I went out and bought was On the Heights of Despair. Um, but I, I don't think that's the only thing he's ever been. I mean, he's certainly we have Lovecraft influences in some of his work. Certainly Poe is an influence in some of his work, especially earlier work. Um, uh, but, yeah, philosophically been atmospheric 150% um, story has always been uh, I, it seems like a, a, a second consideration you know yeah. I had not read much Ligotti poetry until today <coughs> I I got um, I bought um, it was death poems on Kindle today which if, for those who want to read him immediately, there are four or five of his books available on Kindle, if you have a Kindle. But uh, <laughs> the first poem in the book, Death is frightening and dying just as bad. Say what you will, we don't take it well. Then how can we live with all that ahead? Something must be fooling us constantly. Our brains are tricked so that we don't believe for whatever reason and we won't go on and on. Our thoughts are clouded so that we can't conceive the exact process that's waiting for us. Or perhaps we think that when the moment comes, someone else will arrive to take over, will survive. Where logic is concerned, concerned, we're all thumbs. How couldn't we know we were born to go? I think that might sum up 
a lot of it. <laughs> you know. You know what do you what do you guys think? Yeah, that, that fits. Um, I'm not in love with the death poem with myself. I bought the book, but uh, I don't know. To me, it seems almost like uh, not not up to the standard of his fiction as far as the language. Some of the language can just blow you away with, with the richness of the images and stuff, and to me, the death poems are a little flat. I wouldn't disagree with that, no. yeah. No, not at all. And, and, and while we're talking about him as, as language, my first encounter with Thomas Ligotti was in uh, Songs of a Dead Dreamer when it came out. And I'm one of those who read from the beginning to the end. I figure an editor or a writer spent a lot of time composing a table of contents. That's the way they wanted it to be, so that's the way I read. And I immediately fell in love with the frolic. And to this day, um, well, this, is, this is one of the reasons why. Well, or in the black foaming gutters and back alleys of paradise, in the dank, windowless gloom of some galactic cellar, in the hollow, pearly worlds found in sewer-like seas, in starless cities of insanity, and in their slums, my awestruck little deer and I have gone frolic. I mean, that's why I fell in love with Ligotti's language. Not only do I love the story, um, uh, but, you know, in dank, windowless gloom of some galactic cellar, in the holly, hollow, pearly worlds found in sewer-like seas, in starless cities of insanity, and their slums. That, to this day, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I think Songs of a Dead Dreamer, if I remember correctly, came out in about 82. So, here we are 30 years later, and... That still thrills me to no end. Yeah. Um, so it, so his prose writing is poetry, and his poetry is prosaic. Yeah, we could say that. Well, his prose is pretty poetic. Yeah, That's very. Right. Yeah, but he's got well, a back. And again, if, if, if we go back to Turan, um, if you read, let's pick on... On the Heights of Despair, which is my favorite, um, that is very poetic language in that book. Um, you know, some of the some of the philosophers, especially that one, and it seems Turan was somebody that Ligotti was influenced by or very attracted to early on. Um, I, I don't know what other ones, you know, held such sway. Um, I, I'm, 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 and I'm sure other ones did, uh, but but Charan's philosophy, his, his 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 physical writing was extremely poetic, um, and and also you know when we look at Ligotti's early stuff and we look at the O influence in there, um, again we 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 have that poetic writing, so. Um, it just seems like Ligotti's always been attracted to that. Um, uh, I, I think it's part and parcel of who he is as a writer. Um, even if we go to um, the conspiracy against the human race, we, we can see that represented in, in, in that volume as well. Well, and his, his fiction is not very... It seemed to me, you guys can agree or disagree, realistic, and I and I say that in a complimentary way. You know, it's almost when you read a short one of his stories, you you feel like you're in a dream. Very much so. That that's that's how I feel about most of you know his best fiction. Yeah. So, um, but again, look at look at some of his, you know, uh, you know we say Poe and Lovecraft as influences, but if if we look at other influences, be they Robert Walzer or um, uh, Bruno Schultz, you know, th there's all these Eastern European writers who who 
are, are like that, dreamlike, surrealistic, very weird, classically weird in your Eastern European in an Eastern European manner. And and those influences are, are monumental on Ogadi. And and they're everywhere in his work. Um, you know, we as let's say a horror community or a Lovecraftian community want to look towards cosmicism. Uh, you know, we want to we 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 select the Poe because it, it's 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 well known to us. It's it's normal. Um, you know, a general horror reading readership aren't aren't aware perhaps or haven't read much Bruno Schultz or or Robert Walzer. Um, uh, if we look. Um, Ligotti wrote the uh, introduction to Roland Tupor's The Tenant. Uh, no, you know, um, uh, I've never heard Ligotti mention it, but I should think things like there must be uh, some Jean Ray or some Alfred Kubin that, that he likes. Um, uh, it, th those, those influences seem obvious to me, but then again, um, you know, having my long association with Cisco, and and Cisco was turning me on all that stuff, you know, back in the '90s when I hadn't come across it. Um, I mean, I still remember the first time Cisco met, mentioned Jean Ray, and I, and I just shrugged. It's like never heard of him. And next month there was Cisco who handed me a copy of Malper Twee, you know, and it's like you need this, so. We we get we get a ton of that in Ligotti, um, which is a good thing. I I, I and, and I think um, like the Vandermeers, their their benchmark collection, the I'm Weird. I my copy of the Weird. Yeah, there you go, perfect. There, Jean Ray, a, a lot of these guys are represented in there, and um, you know, Ligotti has read more outside the box, I think, than inside the box, which is is a good thing. And I think it's also what's going on in weird fiction in the in this, you know, since the turn of the century, we are seeing more and more literate. If if we go all the way to the left and look at my good friend Jeff Thomas here, um, there's somebody who is not a stranger to the European elements that are rife in weird fiction. Um, when you read Jeff, you can see how well acquainted he is with, with, with some of these writers that I'm mentioning. Um, well, coincidentally, I was going to pick on Jeff next and then probably Tom Lynch since I don't get these guys in here as, as often as, as uh, some of you guys. Uh, yeah, defend yourself, Jeffrey. <laughs> yeah. What was the question? Uh, there, is no question. <laughs> there is no question. We just want to get your impression, sense. like a general impression. <laughs> I, I uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with. I haven't read um, Conspiracy Against the Human Race, and I, I, I'm not interested in Lagarde's philosophy being distilled from his fiction. I like how it is. It permeates his fiction, and the feeling that he imparts to you. But I, to me, it's hard to say this in a way that doesn't sound like uh, insulting to the man. He, he, but if you read interviews with him, he's the first person to admit that he is not uh, the most well-adjusted person. He's an unhappy person, and his philosophy reflects the unhealthy feelings of somebody who's mi miserable mm -hmm. in the existence. Oh, indeed it does. And I don't think that's something are you going to try to convince people that they should embrace your philosophy of being miserable. I don't, I don't see the, the value of it. I, I see the value in expressing your emotions and your feelings through your art. And then people, because we're all miserable and suffer in, in our own way, we can relate to that as it is manifested in the art. As a philosopher, I, I don't really have an interest in, in, in reading that. 
as an artist, I respect him as highly as I respect anybody. I, I am, like I say, I, if, if he is kind of going the route, like uh, Mike said, of, of focusing more on, on philosophy than fiction, that's not an avenue that I really care well, to. What are some of your favorite stories of his, uh, then, Jeff? I, I can't think of any particular titles at the moment. I've read everything. I, I'm, I think I've read every, every piece of fiction he's done. Mm -hmm. um, but it would have been years ago. The last collection I read by him was Teatro El Grotesco, and uh, with, in, in, in that collection, I saw the philosophy was was coming out more strongly in the stories. But um, but I, I love his work. I, I loved uh, my work is not yet done. I thought that was a fantastic satire of office life and and so forth. And Cor work. Corporate horror is good at that. Yeah, corporate mm -hmm. horror. It was, it was fantastic. And it was funny. It, that showed you the, the humorous side of Lagarde. I think it was a riot. Um, but, and ironically, ironically, that's I, I like that work less than his early and middle period work. Um, and, and philosophically, I, I found the conspiracy against the human race uh, interesting, but I don't agree with it. And it's you now that he's come out and said it, it's like okay. I'd like some more fiction, please. <laughs> I, I already know. I already know what you think. Now let's get back to what you feel. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I would. I would this, right? Yeah. Go ahead, Rick. I, I just have a question for you. Was your antipathy to uh, my work is not yet done uh, because you haven't worked a lot in an office? No, I, 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 I've been there. I saw it. I did it. I understand it. Um, and uh, I don't know. It just it didn't thrill me. It's like been there, done that. I guess. Was it, was it because of the humorous kind of it's satirical? Yeah. Well, the other thing too is is um, I, I'm not big on humor and weird fiction in general. I don't um, either. But I thought he balanced it well. I thought it was. Uh, it I was, thought it was well written. It, 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 it's well written. And, 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 and I understand that I am definitely in the minority on the subject of that particular volume, but that one did not grab me. Um, uh, you know, here's my old copy of The Nightmare Factory, you know, Verasty and The Last Feast of Harlequin, like I mentioned, um, The Frolic, The Lost Art of Twilight. Um, you know, um, that's let me, what let me I love. Like. This, um, all of you guys, uh, and especially Tom, if if you feel like saying something next, Tom. But um, if if, an, if an, someone that has not read Legati says to you guys, oh, okay, well, why should I? Why should I read Legati? Tell me, um, give me a reason why he's different. Why? What's that going to do for me? Why should I read him? You know, not in an antagonistical way, but just you know, give me a reason to pick up one of his books. What what would be some responses you would have for that person? Um, I'm probably not the best one to answer that one, but um, in in my case, a lot of the, the people that I know and respect and listen to keep recommending it, and it's the kind of thing that say, you know, if you hang out with these people because you respect their opinions and you like the work that they do, and they say, really, it's important for right. what it is we're doing here, then it's like, you know, well, yeah. Then what about the rest of you guys? How would you guys answer that question? If, if, you know, one of the, the first place I encountered Ligotti was in a little uh, chapbook, I think, of, I read his stories, The Spectacles in a Drawer. And the next place I encountered him is on the cover of Fantasy and Science Fiction with <clears> the last piece of the Harlequin. <clears throat> and, and those stories are pretty well rooted in Lovecraftian horror. But since then, he has taken a path from Lovecraftian horror in a completely his own direction. And, and yes, it has led to a very dark spot. But it... I, it, it you really should understand that. You should 
here's a guy who's, who's, who has been willing through his art to go someplace and do some things and come back and report back and say, this, it, down this path, madness lies, is, is what comes to mind. And right. Yeah, and that's well said. This, yeah. is, this is the report back on my journey, and damn, please don't go down this path. Yep. I mean, like I said, when I was reading from the frolic, you know, in, in starless um, slums of insanity, in the sewers of, you know, the galactic world of sewers, he went into Lovecraft's cosmicism, he went deep, he went all the way, pun intended, to the shadows at the bottom of the world, and he's, as Pete said, he's reporting back what he saw, felt. Um, like a lot of people who start with Lovecraft, I think the better writers, as a rule, um, yep, we we play Lovecraft for a while. We swim in it. We may return to it, but we leave it. it it's, it's healthy. There's a lot you can do with it. But once you go rooting around in the darkness, once you step outside that campfire light that Laird discusses so often, when you're out in the darkness, the darkness becomes personal, and you become your own writer. Ligotti's become his own writer, in the same way that Laird has become his own writer, or, or Jeff. You know, a, a lot of us left where we started, we still return there. You know, it's fun to go, go play once in a while. And I do think one of the answers to that question that I asked is if you, since we have mostly a Lovecraftian audience, is if you do enjoy reading Lovecraft, if you are a Lovecraft fan, he's not a Lovecraft clone, but if, you, if you're a Lovecraft fan, you're going to enjoy reading his work, you know? Oh, yeah. A Veracity and the last, fe last Feast of Harlequin. Mm -hmm. um, th there are a half a dozen classic early, mid-period Ligotti stories that every Lovecraftian either loves or needs to read. Mm -hmm. um, and, you uh, know, go ahead, Pete. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. There's um, Michael Chabon has several short stories that people cite as Lovecraftian pastiches. Um, the Black Mill is is the most common one. And the God of Dark Laughter, I think. It, thank you. The God of Dark yeah. Laughter is the other one. Uh, I would sorry. go out on a limb and say that Shaban is not mimicking Lovecraft. That he is in actuality mimicking Ligotti. I see that, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you, particularly the God of Dark Laughter, you, you pair that story up with The Last Feast of the Harlequin, mm -hmm. man, those are bookends. Yeah. They, they really echo each other. And, oh. yeah, you could say he's, he's aping Lovecraft, but I really think he's going for the Ligotti field. And he nails it. He really mm -hmm. does. Yes, he does. Um, you, know, the other, you know, the other stories in this genre, and, and Joe talked about this briefly, um, you know, I would, Joe, I would put your first novel into that category of, of going someplace dark and reporting back. But then being able to go someplace else, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, treading in the waters, but not being there. Right. Um, the other one I would put into that is uh, C.J. Henderson's "The Questioning of the Azatothian Priest," where he pretty much, you know, justifies doing whatever you want. And that that language that C.J. uses is. Echoed very strongly in in um, True Detective, uh, and so yeah, there's this sort of of other subset of stories that start Lovecraftian and just go someplace really really darker, and most of us can only spend a few minutes there. Right, but I I think <laughs> early on we were we were getting little finger posts, little indications from Ligotti. 
right from the get go that as he starts walking these dark paths, um, we we are we are we are going to go um, to places we haven't been. Um, Places I don't want to go that often. Hmm. You know, the, and the thing is, it's interesting people's reactions to. First of all, I, I agree with what something Joe said a minute ago that okay, he's written conspiracy against the human race. He doesn't really need to do it again, and I agree with that. I do enjoy his fiction just for the atmosphere of it, not because any of it contains that philosophy or not. But well, you know, is he even uh, writing I, any more fiction? Sorry. Is he even going to be writing any more fiction? I was. Um, I was under the impression he has. In his, in his conspiracy against the human race, it's interesting to get people's. There, there's so many varying reactions to it. You know, some people are it just totally turns them off. I guess I, my personal reaction is that I agree with a lot of what he says. I think he's describing reality. Where, where it ends for me is, you know, is his. What do we do about it? Since reality is this way, what do we do about it? I disagree with him on that. What I personally feel like we do about it is, you know, not to oversimplify, but if the situation sucks this much, then the best thing that we can do as human beings is to make it easier for each other. To, uh, you know, not sound like Pollyanna, but to treat each other with kindness and try and make it a little bit better for everybody else since we are in this situation. Uh, that's where I agree, disagree with him. You know, on the on the Thomas Ligotti forums, there's been a big uh, split lately between people who are primarily there to s talk about the fiction and people that are primarily there because they are adherents to the philosophy or they're interested in the philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the past, we all sort of coexisted, but there's been a, a bit more of a split in people on one side saying. <coughs> Uh, you can't really be here and and say you're into Magadi unless you fully buy into the philosophy. Oh, I disagree. I, I, I yeah, I'm with Mike. I strongly disagree. Yeah. I, when when I was in high school, I used to remind people that it's my democratic right to be a communist. <laughs> and yeah. I can be a Lovecraftian and appreciate Ligotti, but I don't have to, you know, slit my wrists every night. Right. And 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 I can and well, I have read the conspiracy of the human race. And 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 we'll sidetrack a bit. I, I mean, in the Grim Scribes puppets, um, Grim Scribes puppets began because I wrote an eleven thousand word novella called "And This Is Where I Go Down in the Darkness," and my idea for the novella was I wanted to explore the power of the conspiracy of the human race in a reader. So I talked to Tom and I explained to him briefly what I wanted to do and, and of course I was going to need to quote heavily from the conspiracy against the human race and I got his permission. Um, but just because I go swim in that pond doesn't mean at the end I want to slip my wrists. Um, it's interesting. I understand it. Some parts of it is like looking in a mirror. Yeah. Is that scary? But I agree with Mike. It's like go in the other room and get a hug. You know, <laughs> laugh with your buddies. Have Sit a around and joke around it, on Facebook. The way that, what you do about it? You know. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're well. What we do is we row against it. Yeah, exactly. You know, we. If it's that, when it's that black, and I get there, and Mike gets there, and I know a lot of us suffer, when we get there, we claw our way back. Because that hug, that joke with your friend, you know, that endearment, that closeness to another human being that, that, that is so important to us, that's, that's why we're rowing. There's a, the, there are galactic sewers, and we're swimming in them. But if, if, if there's a way to fight the current, then we'll, we'll most days try to fight that current. Yeah, I like what you said about that. That's a good way to put it, rowing, rowing against it instead of going yeah. with it. You know? Yeah. I'm gonna, well, first, 
for two things. Uh, the first one is that there's a, a big side discussion going on. It looks like there's going to be a new book out in June from Subpress, The Spectral Link, New Fiction. Right. right. A couple of stories, right. Yeah. Uh, Ligotti, Ligotti, Ligotti said, no, I'm out of gas. Okay, Willem says he's out of gas every other week. Okay? <laughs> Things change. We're writers. As writers, you get here, this is it, you're done, you stop. And you're sure, maybe you're positive you're done. And then a month later, or six months later, or a year later, all of a sudden, whammo. Something hits you, you know, and you're back on whatever horse. Right. Um, that, that happened with Stephen King in the Dark Tower, after he finished Dark Tower, he said he was going to stop writing, and then he's waiting right. the thing is, is full throttle. Right. Whether it's, whether it's Nicoly or Griffin or Thomas or Ligotti or Pulver or Pugmire, forget what we say on occasion. We cannot not write. This already, is, I'm already there with you. Yeah. What'd you say? <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 it, I have been accused of not being able to write. So, and and I know a few other people on this pa panel have also. So. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah. What's happening? Accused. <laughs> they put me up on a stake, nailed me up there, and then they set that son of a bitch on fire. Yeah. You know, and then they came. Then they came later with shotguns to make sure that I was truly breathless and would not utter another word. You know? Um. Yeah. So the other thing I wanted to mention, and this is going to be a little not self-serving, but. Last night I watched with my son for the first time Watchmen, oh, yeah. and there is a, a a long conversation, and actually throughout the whole movie there there's a a set of conversations that really are relevant to this this conversation we're having right now. And whether you want to take the, uh, the comedian or Rorschach <laughs> or or Dr. Manhattan. I mean, I'm, it's, it's comic book pop psychology, but one of the things Alan Moore does is he really takes those different viewpoints on the meaningless of the universe. Right. And then uses the character of the Silk Spectre, this girl, um, woman, to put it all into perspective and, and say, well, it does matter, and here's why. Right. And you know, you can look at the world as a joke, or that the world should be punished, or that the world is meaningless, that a live body is no different than a dead body. But when you have someone who is a unique individual, that's very different. Anyway. Yeah, and if you read the comic book, it's it's got even more of that. Uh, right, right. It's almost as if it, there's a philosophy text buried in there. Is he driving while... Yes. <laughs> He's on the highway. Flying down the highway. All right, hold tight. He's a highway okay, don't, star. Don't try this at home. God, I'm just going to prop this phone on my steering wheel while I drive. No, he's got one of those ear things. He better <laughs> have one of those ear things. It's a smart car. <laughs> <laughs> well, the car... Well, Hopefully it's a smart car, because I'm not sure about the driver. Monster, I would like to join the Lovecraft Ezine chat, please. <laughs> join yeah. me. Yeah. Did you yeah. see where that guy in the last who got killed watching porn while he was driving? Uh, well, while he can't what? respond, while he can't respond, and we... Yeah, watching you guys is not porn. <laughs> that's, uh... We're, that's... we're the best kind. Look... I appreciate that. That's my new slogan. Watching Lovecraft using chats is not porn. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's Scott Nicoly, ladies and gentlemen. And hey, while Scott. we, while we briefly touched on the Grim Scribe's puppets, um, 
uh, the inaugural issue of the best weird fiction of the year. The table of contents was announced today. And two stories that will appear in that issue, which is being edited by none less than Laird Barron. One is by Scott, and it's uh, I Exchange Bank. I Exchange Bank. story, which I was beyond pleased to have the opportunity to publish. And the other one is by Livia Llewellyn. The Prince. Right. So I was absolutely uh, floored and gleeful to see um, two stories from the Grim Scribes puppets um, will be included in this inaugural um, volume of the best weird fiction of the year. One of your stories, too. And a shameless plug, <laughs> something I wrote for uh, Mike Davis's Lovecraft e-zine will also appear. On a table of contents that's got Jeff Vandermeer, Karin Tidbeck. Michael Blumley. Yeah, Damian Walters. I mean, the, the, the table of contents is, like, thrilling. Yep. I was like, uh, Wow. Jeff Thomas is on the table of contents in that. Jeff Thomas is also on the table of contents for the Grim Scribes Puppets. Was guys everywhere. <laughs> Thomas? Yeah, you know, you'd think this guy can write or something. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you know, whether it's Punk Town, the, the whole problem with, 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 with Thomas, though, is, is he's so damn independent. <laughs> you know, here you are, you, 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 you coerce him into writing this brilliant story called The Spoon, and then he up and decides, no, it's not a spoon, it's a fork. <laughs> that was now, the whole, prob the whole was problem is, is the fork is a brilliant piece of weird literature, but I fear that the spoon is lost. Do you happen well, to have one? He decided there is no spoon. Yeah, that was the Do you Quaid. have a copy of that, well, I, I Maybe I do on my old hard drive. That was the Quay's joke. You, you know, they didn't want to go with it, so... Oh, I know, I know. But I, had, I, I, had I still people. think that should appear sometime, somewhere. Yeah. The original version. I, I might have it somewhere. Um... So let's yeah, to, um, gave you a phone. Grim Scribes, the Grim Scribes puppets. Um, Michael Griffin has a story in the Grim Scribes puppets, which I believe was his first anthology appearance. Um, and, and all and all of these, the W. Scott, Mike, all have been highly praised um, by various people. Up into and including Peter Tennant from Black Static. Um, so, and the Grim Scribes puppets. I get too. Also, um, on the final ballot for the HWA Stoker Award in um, for superior achievement in, in an anthology. So, and it is thanks to contributors like Jeff, like Mike, like Scott, like Livia, you know. Um, it's not the book that's up, Joe, it's you. Okay, it's me, but I I represent the book, you know. Well, the book is better looking than you, but you're the one on the ballot. Well, we all, we, we all can't look like Doctor Strange like you with your little do-rag, or is that a hat that's backwards? I mean, there's a dust. There's a dust storm going on right now. About oh, sixty miles an hour. There's always a dust storm in New Mexico, ladies and gentlemen. He's in disguise, hiding from the police. Yeah. Hey, Scott, yeah, you're going to the film festival, right? Yeah. Yeah. I thought so. Good. And his book will be at the film festival. His debut yeah, right. collection. Yeah, here, I'm, here I'm holding a copy of it that I don't have yet. So. He didn't overnight you one? Uh, if he, I haven't been to the post office yet, so I don't oh. think so. 
Everybody email Dennis Weiler and tell him that he is a cur. For not no, no, don't, 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 don't do that. No, okay. Dennis is stressed out enough, I think. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I was just... He can only handle so much kidding. electronic communication. Yeah, that's true. I was just kidding. So... Uh, actually, you know, if you are a Legati fan, Lovecraft fan, you uh, we might as well just mention Scott's book. I mean, I think you're you would be a fan of his upcoming collection as well. Um, Scott, you want to take a minute or two and just talk about the book? Uh, what kind of what kind of stories there are and so forth? Um, yeah, I don't know what to say. Well, it's, it's called Anakai Tangata. And uh, it's from it's come out. It's just out from Fidogan and Bramer. Mm -hmm. It's 350 pages, and uh, that's only eight stories. It's mostly novellas. They're longer stories. Um, yeah, I would. I mean, it definitely. I would consider all of them to be weird cosmic horror. Uh, I, I specifically am focused on that type of writing. Um, so yeah, I would I would think it would fall in the range of people that uh, are interested in Levati, Lovecraft, uh, Aikman, uh, Terry Lamsey, you know Terry Lamsley, Randy Campbell, Jean Jean Ray. Those those if you like those writers, I would hope that you would like it. Yeah. Yep. Well, for probably a little more rough sex than the average Levati. <laughs> right. <laughs> Laird Barron wrote. Yeah, Laird. Laird yeah, Laird. <laughs> Larry Perrin, uh, Joe Pulver, John Langan, Richard Gavin, Simon Strauss. So that's 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 you know my bailiwick. What, Scott, what's the title in reference to? It's the name of a cave on Easter Island, on oh. Papua New Guinea. Although the the basis of the title of that being the title for the story, that particular story, and for the book, uh, it, is that that might not be the actual the cave that's known. It's a very famous cave. It's a World Heritage site. But the premise is that there may be another cave that was that that name really belonged to. Uh, um, in Rapa Nui, Anakai Tangata is cave eat man, so uh, it's usually translated as the cave of the man eaters, and it's a cave. It's a sea cave where supposedly during the Tangata Manu festival, the bird uh, festival, the winners would eat the losers more or less. Uh, um, but it could also mean the cave where men eat. Or the cave that eats men. Very cool. And mark yeah. my words, a year from now, when it is award time, <clears> throat> this throat> book will be on lists. When I remember it, when I read uh, Eyes Exchange Bank, uh, especially, I've read about half the book now, uh, Scott, and I, I remember when I read the Eyes Exchange Bank story, I, th I thought, wow, seems a little Ligotti to me, which. It's a great book. I've read, like I said, I've read about half of it and so far. And you, you guys, you know, talking to the audience, you guys should pick it up for sure. Well, thanks. Yeah, awesome. Um, you can just go to Fedogan and Bremer, uh, F E D O G N -E -N, and Bremer dot com. Probably yeah, pretty not pretty much. If you just search, the, you know, if you can't find that URL, just search Fedogan. It'll pop up. You'll get their website yeah. real quick. But there yeah. is no other Fedogan. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Good idea. Search Google Fedogan and Bremer, and and, um, and then search for Scott's book, which is spelled uh, uh, A N A K A I, and I don't have the third word in my head. T A N G A. And it is on Amazon. Yeah. And anybody who's on Facebook, if you go to Scott's page or my page or Langan's page or Laird's page, you'll find links to the book. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of it, people have shared it. I've been really grateful for that. So, yeah. Well, humbling. Those those of us who've had the the privilege of reading this book early, um, this is a phenomenal work. This is an important work. I'm sure once you start to see interviews, our reviews arrive. One of the things that will be discussed is that this is not just another debut collection by a good writer. We, we, are, we are seeing the premiere of a very, very brilliant writer. Um, and if you don't believe me, 
Ask John Langdon. If you don't believe me, ask Laird Barron. Um, if, uh, if you make me blush, I'm just going to freeze the picture on, the on here. Message board, everybody. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, sorry. I should have. Um, yeah, I'll have a review up before next uh, video chat as well, Scott. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, you can give us a teaser, Justin. It's it's good. It's good so far. <laughs> <It's> good. <laughs> uh, really good. Right, yeah, okay. yeah, but he liked my book, so you know. I I just ordered <laughs> Scott's book even as we speak. Cool. Sorry. Thank you. Wow, and you think Scott's talent is being on here and driving at the same time? <laughs> Thomas ordered a book. Yeah, mm. I just bought a book. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually I'm actually parked outside a corporate coffee joint. You know, but oh, okay. their wi I couldn't get their Wi-Fi. I'm using my um, I'm, I'm using my wireless, my own cellular data anyway. So. I hope you're stealing their Wi-Fi. No, I could. It wouldn't work. I couldn't get on using theirs for some reason. So. Oh, okay. Hmm. Well, crap using is it? Bandwidth log apparently. Sorry, what? I said Lovecraft using video chats or bandwidth hogs, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, we should so anyway, getting back to Lagati. Um, where were we? We should well, get. I, was, I, was, I, I had ventured off into Grimscribe land because it was inspired by Lagati, so that's where we. Were you going to say something, Jeff? I was I was going to say we we, we should focus uh, a little uh, attention on Tom here and thank him for publishing Grim Scratch book that we've been talking about so much here. Uh, okay, so so while we're on that, um, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time, uh, and uh, I got great advice from really smart people. So um, you know, Scott David Angelowski, who would have joined us this evening, uh, but he had to work. Um, he, he and Joe started talking about this back in the day, and Scott basically told me if MRP didn't put this out, it would be uh, a bad move. Uh, so I was like, okay, you know. And, and 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 I want to thank Scott and Tom for for greenlighting Grim Scribes as well as the season in Carcosa. Um, they they were not the first publisher I approached, and um, but they they were the ones who were willing to who went hey yeah this is a great idea, and and also in some way when I was working on my Ligotti tribute novella, and when I finished it and I ultimately had to send it to Tom. So he could see what I did, and he really loved it. Um, um, once, once he liked it, he told me how much he liked it. And that's when I started thinking of. I wonder who else might be interested in doing a, you know, a tribute story. And in part, my idea came from Scott because back in the day. He did. Um, Joe, hang on. Okay, Scott, can you hit me for a second? Yeah. My phone overheated. Oh. Your your wind's coming through pretty heavy. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. I had to go. I had to go outside that the wind blow on the phone. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So Scott had edited a tribute to Ramsey Campbell and one to Brian Lumley. Now, there are tons of tributes to Lovecraft that have been such, but Lovecraft's a dead writer. And, and that was the thing I what? began thinking of is Scott has... Uh, He's not going to be at the film festival? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> Damn it. I quit. Off. I'm leaving. <laughs> so, so I started thinking, yeah, to do tribute to a living author, an important author... Um, is is a is is a great idea, and and that's where I start. You know, approach Tom, um, and of course Justin Steele, of course, has done the same thing recently. Stole my idea, actually. <laughs> and your writers. 
Grim Scribes was actually an inspiration for that, yeah. too. So. <laughs> this guy Steel copied me. I think well, let's do it. What's his name? What's his name? Steel. Well, yeah, there you go. You know, I, I think there should be an acknowledgement in the book is I stole this idea from Joe Polver. Joe, you should be one of the editors on the cover. What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, right, I should. <laughs> oh, yeah, there we it, go, Justin Steele. <laughs> the Purloined Editorial Project. Oh, boy. Um, you know, they haven't released the talk yet, Joe, so I, I'd shut up before they cut you. Exactly. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We can give you a co-editor credit and take your story out of the book. Well, no, we can yeah. we can talk about it because we've been given permission. Um, right? Where did Justin go? Oh, there's Justin. I'm right here. Yeah. We can talk about that we're in this and who else is in it. Yeah. Even though you have like the two people who haven't announced it yet themselves. Right. Two, I still haven't seen those two individuals mention it anywhere. Yeah, but one of those individuals isn't really ever on the internet. Yeah, you're right. He probably wouldn't be mad if you posted on Facebook about him. And and half of the time he doesn't list. And H.P. Lovecraft died before he could announce it. So, <laughs> you know, um, but everybody else who's in it that is on social media has jumped up and down for joy and said, "We're in the new Justin Steele, Ross Lockhart, Laird Baron tribute." I know Mr. Griffin has, and I know Mr. Nicoly has, and that guy Polver, he, I think he mentioned it, you know. Well, I did, I did get the idea from Grim Scribes. It was kind of like you said, you know, when you did Carcosa. Um, you, you know, you had the Chambers Anthology, but then with Grim Scribes, it's, it's you know, well, Ligotti's still alive and, and still writing here and there, and usually you don't see many tributes until, you know years later um, right. and, and I thought the, the Grim Scribes was, was pretty excellent you know um, you know probably the best I would say anthology of the year last year so I think it's um, you know rightfully uh, you know nominated for uh, the Stoker um, thank you I appreciate that I think one thing you saw with uh, the reviews of it is it and, and you know not to to any my horn or any individual horn, but almost every review I saw said there's not a there's not a bad story in the book. That every story was good. Yeah. And that's I think that's really a testament to Joe's uh, yeah. work as an editor. You know, I, I was able to work with Joe on some previous projects that that didn't go as well because of some of the other people involved. But I saw what a phenomenal editor he was, and I jumped at the chance to be a part of this project. Well, I think you covered so many different bases on like um. You, you know, different aspects of Legatus fiction, you know, like um, Livia's uh, uh, story, The Furnace, you know, The Dying Town, kind of that whole sense of urban decay, which you see a lot of in Legatus fiction, you know, some of the stories, you know, The Human Moth, um, I, I think is the one I'm thinking of, and some others have that kind of, that whole dreamlike sense of um, many of Legatus stories, and then you have, um, I think Nicole Cushing wrote The Company Town, and yeah. it was a little bit of um, a little bit of that kind of Ligotti corporate, you know, like dark, but a little bit of humor, you know, mixed in. Um, you you know, Mike, I think Mike Griffin did the same sort of thing. Yeah, Mike yeah. Griffin did a phenomenal job um, with his corporate horror tale in Grim Scribes. Um, well, thanks. You, you would, it's a great story, and you would never know he wrote it wearing red pants. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a scene of her. And and that was that was the one thing that made it so difficult to accept. You know, it, it's like you, you have talents like Scott Nicoley and, and Jeff Thomas in the book, and here's some guy wearing red pants, and he wants to be in your book. I mean, red pants. Come on, who wants to be associated with anyone who wears red pants? I, I think he pulls it off pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to know. I don't want to be there when he pulls the pants up. I, I, have, I, have never, I, have never, I have never looked down there to see if he wears it well or not. You know, I mean, I want to associate with writers like Scott Nicoley and, and, and Jeff Thomas. You know, you look at these guys, they look like real writers. You, they, you know, 
unless you're the Are you saying Ambrose we look like bums or something? Like Ambrose Bierce wandering the north of Mexico? Yeah, well, you know, you and Bierce probably could get along quite well roaming around the American Southwest. <laughs> um, you know, I would safely say that you're not, unless somebody's handing out a million dollars in cash and it's tax-free, you're not going to see Jeff Thomas or Scott Nicoley or even Joe Pulver in red pants. I think at the next Necronomicon, we should all wear red pants. I think we, you know, Ordering. yeah, at least like red sweatpants or something. By the time you guys all get your red pants, I'm going to have moved on to yellow pants. Oh, oh there we go, yeah. Uh -huh. In other words, he'll buy a pair of white pants, and by the time he gets to the show, they'll be yellow. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. So, so if everybody wants to see the number one writer in the world that's associated with red pants, <laughs> stop over in, in a couple weeks to the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival, and red pants will be prancing around, you know, or whatever, whatever motion he calls it. Right um, Mike. Uh, no. Okay. I got. I'm wearing some pretty ordinary blue jeans today. But Pete keeps showing off his, his thighs there. I'm not quite sure. I, I was wondering what he's trying to show the camera. Uh, <laughs> mostly crotch shots, it looks like. God. Oh, they're my red pants. Oh, boy. Well, there's some things you can't unsee. I'll see. Yeah. <laughs> and and you know, we Joe. were just saying Thomas Ligotti has really gone far afield and looked into the shadows at the bottom of the world. Well, I guess you can't say that the uh, Lovecraft e zine is not foreign anymore because we just went there. <laughs> Have, has anyone here ever read the um, the it's a two volume um, the Nightmare Factory graphic novel adaptation of a few of his stories? No. Has anyone here check that out? Some of them, yeah. I don't even know about that. Yeah, I, no. It's it's okay. Yeah, I bought the first one and liked it okay, but that's not enough to buy the second one. Yeah. Hmm. Who, who did it? It's, I think it's a different author, each um, different artist, each story. Hmm. I'll try to find the link. I just know some of you guys were comic you know, fans, so I didn't know if you'd be interested in checking it out. I do like the cover. I've got, I've got one of them. They're pretty good. Right, but not enough to buy the second volume. Yeah. Man. Yeah, it was put out by Harper. Uh, Justin and I both linked it simultaneously. Great minds think alike. I think the second one is Gas Station Carnival's Clown Puppet, The Chemist, and the Sect of the Idiot. I like the Yes, it's the, the one I have. Yeah, I think the, the Clown Puppet one um, is one that has the art I really like. The only reason I buy Ligotti books is so they'll be with five hundred dollars when they go out of print, and this one wasn't gonna, wasn't limited, so I didn't buy it. <laughs> I'm joking, oh, but... My word! <laughs> As a former bookseller, you know I, I have to appreciate that point of view. <laughs> no, 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 no. So no, is no. Tom going to bring some more copies of Grimscribe's puppets to HPLFF? I believe copies of Season in Carcosa and Grim Scribes will be available um, at the film festival. I know at, at Necronomicon it was a big thing for people to you know try to get as many signatures from those of us yeah, who are in the as possible. I didn't get my copy until afterwards, and so it's going to be one of the things I bring to the film festival. Yeah, so in, in Providence <clears throat> we had eleven or twelve. People just from Grim Scribes mm -hmm. alone, there. Um, I, I couldn't. I couldn't turn around without someone else asking me to sign. <laughs> sign they went thing. pretty fast after those readings as well. Yeah. It, with it, yeah. When I mean, um, Mike and I read, mm -hmm. it, it, I think they sold out within like 15 minutes. Yeah. It was. Mm. There's only. Uh, there's only one Kindle copy left. So get it before. <laughs> <we go. laughs> it. Hey, can we auction that off? Could do. It's got, it's got a virus in it, so it self-destructs after you read it, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you have to rebuy it. Tom, can you confirm that, that, that those books will be at the Film Fest? I have been talking to Brian and Gwen. They did put in an order. They said they um, 
wanted to make sure they had some more of my books. I'm not sure if they have that one, but um, my printer's been shipping things pretty darn quickly, so if they do put in an order for more, if they find they will go up and get you. Well, for the first time, I'm going to have some actual print, print stuff to, uh, to bring to the film festival. I don't know if I'll bring very much, but uh, I'll bring a few print copies of Lovecraft Easy. Cool. You know, I, I took, I, well, I talked about it last time. Never mind. What, Pete? I, I read from that at uh, the International Conference on the Fantastic and, and got a, you know, a lot of people were interested in that magazine. Oh, that's good to know. They were surprised that a easing could go to a magazine and, and do what you have done. Yeah, usually everyone goes the opposite direction, right? Right. Well, I don't want to be like everybody else. <laughs> You're not. Don't worry about it. Are you going to be able to bring copies of the April edition? Yeah, should be able to. Oh. Oh, man. If we get it done in time. That's the King in Yellow issue. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I want to well, see that. Well, I mean, I can say that, but it'll, I mean, it'll be available in print by then. So as to whether I can get it. Yeah, there's a couple of people here might be sort of interested in that issue. Yeah, could be. You can raise your hands, fellas. Well, there's, there's a couple right there. Yep, three of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good issue. It should be out in seven or eight days, something like that. Awesome. And I've seen a little bit of the art that Mike has been having done for the stories, and as is usual with Lovecraft Easy, some knockout illustrations coming. They really, really. Cool. Yeah. You know, I'm excited about it. Again, we we talk about this all the time here, but the people behind that that assist Mike with production of the e-zine and, and the magazine are just doing a phenomenal job. They really are. I thought he did it all by himself. <laughs> well, he's, he's, he's more like, uh, he's the, the front man. <laughs> Behind the curtain, he's got all kinds of minions. I just hope he like buys some pizza and, and pretzels and stuff once in a while. Because they work hard. It's, yeah. it's an immense thing that, that you, oh, you know what, Joe? You keep asking me to buy you a pizza, uh, this is what's gonna happen. <laughs> One night when we're at the Griffins, <clears throat> you know, I will buy a pizza. Oh man. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it first. The king of the yachtsmen is buying a pizza. So, so we, we might even force him to get some wings. So Pete, what, what you don't realize is that we eat almost every meal during the film festival at this brew pub that's a block down from the theater, and they sell pizza. Well, there we go. So you'll eat there five times at least in three days. That's that's fine. You know, when when we were at the hotel in Providence. Because of my leg, I probably only ate outside the hotel twice. Mm. Um, Are yeah. you guys going to let me yeah, eat? But next, or... next, next year, you're going to be in better shape. You're going to be able to So, so your, the meat so. on your roommate lasted that long? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and my roommate was Nick Becker. So. Oh. <laughs> and he hasn't been seen since. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the 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 artists that illustrate the stories for Lovecraft Easing and the the audio readers and the people that do the logos and the people that help me line edit and you know to put the issues out and everything they're all pretty talented people uh, very talented people so and we got a uh, we do a comic each uh, each issue we've got a King in Yellow inspired comic too. I sent that to Joe today. Yeah. So done by Ronnie Tucker. Yep. But yeah, it'll be a great issue. Yeah. 
It's going to be fun. Hey, is, is everybody that's on now going to be at the film festival? Mm. Not everybody, um. unfortunately. Isn't Jaya Prakash in it? Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I mean everybody who's on on this chat right now. Oh, no, I won't be. Tom Lynch, you, oh, yeah, Steve, yeah. Mike, the other Mike, Red Pants Mike. Jeffrey, um, Jeffrey sadly is no. Jeffrey, come on, you can do it. <laughs> I wish. Um, I wish. Uh, me, Justin. Um. And virtually, every, but everybody here will be at the next Necronomicon project. Yeah. Yes. But well, I, I want to suggest while we're there that um, you guys all join me one night to go to the Bula Kava house and get Kava. Oh, we'll be following you around. We want we want to see you in your glory. Mike yeah, is going to have. Should go, we should all go out for Kava. I've got a rental car too, so I can take some people. Yeah. Mike, Mike, I think you particularly want to, want to try that. I do. What is it called? Not Mike Griffin. I is. Mike oh, Davis. I do? Yeah. Okay. It, might, it might help you with, with your pain, some of that. So, not that I, I, I support this, but there's a woman who, in in my town, Palm Beach, has sued the local kava bar for getting her addicted. <laughs> You can't you can't get addicted to cops. This is what she says. You know, you can sue for whatever you want. Yeah. Hmm. There's an interesting story though about uh, getting back to cannibalism. There's an interesting story about uh, this from the Kurodahan Press uh, series of four uh, books collecting Japanese stories about this. Uh, one guy who goes and they get him drunk on kava and he participates in a cannibalistic ritual. So just I thought that was just part of what happened. I'm not saying that won't happen. I'm just saying you won't get a dick. I knew I was invited for something. <laughs> I was hoping we would cover cannibalism today. So. I'm only addicted to love, so I'm not worried about no kava. Um, I, I don't want to promise anything, but I, I will do my very best to have actual print copies of the King and Yellow issue there at the film festival. So, uh, Mike, as, as someone who's been there and done that, um, everyone's got to appreciate the leaps and bounds you have to go through to get any physical book in any one place by a given time. I mean, I was late to Necronomicon by several hours because my latest book was due in Providence, but it came to my house. So, it's... Uh, mm. Well, hey Mike, Mike, uh, you want to have a little bit of an advantage there because if I can, if I can just get everything done, and when I say me, I mean me and all the people that help me, of course, because Joe is right. I am, I am lucky enough to have a lot of great people helping me. But if we do get it done in time, and I really am trying to do that, then I'm going to be sending a bunch of copies directly to Gwen and Brian's house, right from the distributor. So that's going to help me. So. Or you could send them to Red Pants University. That's true. I could do that too. You know, well, you're welcome to do that. He's probably got a little bit less stress than Gwen and Brian do right now. Yeah, yes, he does. does. I feel sorry for them. It's yeah. Just like, it's just like with Neil's in Providence. You're you're glad for all that they're doing for you, but you feel bad that it's basically ruining their life for four months. He looked a little bit stressed, but I think the good thing is. You know, he was on last week, and he's like, you know, the second time is going to be so much easier than the first because you know you, you know, it's you learn everything that works and that doesn't work. You know. Yeah. Well, look at Andrew Milligori. For years, we watched him run around like a chicken with his head cut off, and the poor guy never really enjoyed the festival. Yeah, I mean, he, he does now. You know. You know. Oh, now he does. And yeah. here was Gwen and Brian attending the festival and really enjoying it. And now they're, you know, the tables have turned, and, uh, you know. Well, I think we can do it. I just don't want to, I'm not the kind of person that promises something without knowing for sure it's going to happen. But I'm 90% sure we're going to do it. So, yeah. so uh, anyway. Um, yeah. we you know what, um, Go ahead, Pete. Sorry. Since we're talking about the festival... Um, April Moon Books is going to have their new collections 
Is that what you were going to talk about, Tom? Uh, well, you, you, you know, segueing into what's going to be there. Um, but you go ahead, Pete. Yeah, April Moon Books, their new collection of, of Dark Rites of Cthulhu. Um, oh, Black yeah, Magic that's Lovecraftian right. Anthology. Dealing with magic and the rites, you know, Lovecraftian mythos and all that good stuff. And Yeah, that's uh, the Neil Baker one, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Neil Baker's uh, new publishing empire. Yeah, that's right. He's going to be on here next this coming Saturday night, April 5th, to talk about it. Yes. The Midnight Eastern. Uh, I'm going to take my Vibrant to be on for that. Sorry, what? I take my Vibrant, so I'm stay, so I'm still awake at that point. <laughs> yeah. Really yeah. Like, um, we'll, we'll assume, Steve, that you and Tom are in this particular anthology. That is, that is uh, correct. Yeah, I guess so. You could yeah, say I think it's actually orderable now. It happened a little bit yeah, quicker yeah. than you thought. Just went up. Yeah, yeah, you can get it through uh, Create Space. Hmm, okay. Okay. So who's all who's all in that? I mean, um, besides you and Tom. Yeah. <laughs> besides the two of us. Not that that's not enough. <laughs> uh, so let's see. We have um, it's edited by Brian M. Sammons, and we have Lynn Harris, uh, Ed Erdlack, Goodrich, uh, Scott Goodsward, T. Grau, C.J. Henderson, Willie Michael, uh, Christine Morgan, Bob Price, uh, that Rollick character, Josh Reynolds, uh, Brian Sammons, Sam Stone, and Jeffrey Thomas and Don Webb. Josh Reynolds, I remember the very first year of Lovecraft Easy, I remember publishing him. He's he's a pretty talented writer. Indeed. He's he's Josh has a new uh book coming out that's a uh Wad Newton Philip Jose Farmer novel. Oh really? On Phil and Phileas Fogg. It's a sequel to Philip Jose Farmer's the other log of Phileas Fogg. <laughs> it was just announced to be available around uh July. Well, two weeks from now, that's what we'll be doing. We'll be at the film festival. Yep. And speaking of King and Yellow and sharing stuff, Rick is in that issue as well. Uh, Rick's got the Rick's got the big story. Yep, the novella. Nice. I, I I didn't think you were going to accept it because of the length. I was worried mine was too long. I, I, I started to write something, and then I just said it had to, be, you know, it. it uh, I had a, I had originally a much shorter view of how the story was going, and I said, "That's not going to work." So it <laughs> doubled. Well, you know, th these things need to be the length they need to be. Um, you know, and sometimes as an editor, when you're dealing with a, a Scott Nicoly or a Mike Griffin or a John Langan. You just kind of go, mm hmm, oh boy. Um, you, you know that it's going to be a word or two over. Whatever you told them is the hard ceiling. <laughs> or triple. I, I or mean, triple, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Nicoly lost his connection, so we can pick on him, you know. Um, he, Nicoly is John Langan Jr. Yep. You know. Um, He's John Langan in a do rag. Yeah, but but John occasionally writes short stories. Nicoly is almost incapable. <laughs> <laughs> Not that that's a bad thing, though, man. You know, it's no. it, we're, you know it's unfortunately that I ta that I've been calling him KV for all these years because it it probably should be Scott Novella Nicoly. You know? It's a good length, I think, for for horror stories. You know. Yeah. It is yeah. Definitely a big fan of that length. Well, Laird writes uh, very meaty stories too, and it's they're they're it's, they're very rich. Yeah. Oh yeah, they, they are. I, and I'm not picking on novellas. I'm I'm envious of people who are comfortable with that length. I mean, over the years, I've I've only written six or seven. Um, it's <clears throat> it's a hard length, I think, because you know a lot of the collections and what you know the shorter stuff, so they can fit more in. 
or publishers want novels. You know, I think. Um, yeah. You know, I think it makes. Or it's published more... over, you want less shorter things. <laughs> um, uh, Joe, did you you sent me the intro to the King and Yellow issue, right? Yeah, quite a while ago. Yeah, that's right. I just couldn't remember without looking it up. Oh, I hope well, you still have it because I. Yeah, I, I do. Don't know where I put it. <laughs> The other, the other thing is that now that you've gone to twice monthly and the store, your, your, your size is a little longer, you can accommodate a novella. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah we took a few. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, um, well, Tom's story, story is, is very short. I, I think Tom is, if my recollection was, Tom came in well under the, the you know, bottom of what I was looking for. So, you know, when you have a couple of shorter things, you can, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and Mike has been really good mixing up um, length um, throughout the history of Lovecraft Easy. You know, we don't get, you know, one 3,000 word story after another after another. There's, there's novellas, there's poetry, there's short, short work. There's, there's, you know, more normal size shorts. Um, uh, so, so as as far as as, as content, link the content, you know, I I think Mike has been uh, doing that all along, um, and and readers seem to really enjoy it, you know. Yeah, this is under just just under two thousand, and Jay Aprakash is thirteen fifty or so. Yeah, his was severely short, but you know, I I so love JP's work. I think he is, um, well, he's long over. We need a collection of his badly, very badly. Um, he's amazingly talented. Um, yeah, he's one of those guys I keep waiting to just sort of splash and for everyone to notice him because he he's such a great writer, but you don't see his stories in very many prominent places yet. Yeah, I mean, he's one of two people that I am beyond hot to edit. Um, you know, um, the other one is the king of red pants here. <laughs> um, um, his, that'll be the name of his first collection. Yeah. <laughs> Simon you know? Strauss said, he told me short is better, so maybe just calling it the red pants would be best. Yeah. <laughs> Just red, yeah. I think there's... Yeah. All right, people. <laughs> well... <laughs> my life's in red pants. <laughs> well, I appreciate all you guys being here today. I appreciate everybody that's watching, and uh, we'll watch the recorded version in the future. Um, Thomas Ligotti is definitely a, a guy that any Lovecraft fan should be reading if you have not yet read him. Um, the newest uh, post on Lovecraft Easy and I've got a link to his stuff on Amazon. I've also got a link to the tribute anthology uh, that Joe Pulver edited, uh, The Grim Scribes Puppets, which we talked about, about earlier and that's also definitely one that you should pick up. Um, so uh, you, can, you, can, you can find the link to both of those at Lovecraft Easy and um, and uh, try not to, uh, this is important for you to read, just don't have any sharp objects nearby when you read it. <laughs> or pills, no pills. That's right, and no pills, yeah. No nooses, either. Yeah. So, uh, no nooses is good news. <laughs> so anyway, thanks guys, I really appreciate all of you guys being here. And uh, I'm going to see a lot of you guys in a couple of weeks, I think. So. Yep. Looking forward to it, man. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks everybody for watching, too. Thank you, Mike. Yeah.